So our second panel this morning is invest in everyday energy savings. And we've made a couple of switches. We have Dan Schaefer and Pavo Salmi taking over where Dave Bracciano and Doris Heitzman were. Dr. Langwell is still with us, Michael Gordon and Jeremiah Rohr. So I know some of you had a lot of questions on energy and we really want to stress the interconnectedness of energy and water. So the first question I'm going to ask of the panel, we've been talking a lot about low hanging options, you know, low things, low tech things. What are some of the other things that homeowners should determine to do? What are the next best projects that they should get engaged in if they're already doing some of the low hanging options? So, you know, we, we had conversations about low hanging fruit and low hanging fruit is that what we call the no and low cost stuff. And that's the light bulbs and or the weather stripping or caulking, uh, those types of things. And then the next progressive steps that we would look at taking would be really uh, trying to expand addressing that building envelope. And so I think two years ago, we talked about how adding some additional attic insulation uh, could pay for itself over one or two summers uh, with your AC bills or looking at things like radiant barriers. Um, if you have a window that has a lot of exposure to the sun, you might want to add some window tint. So those are things that instead of a 20 or $50 investment might be a, a 500 to $1,000 investment. Uh, and then we can start going above and beyond that to the next level where we start addressing the mechanical equipment, which could be uh, going from a traditional electric hot water heater to a heat pump hot water heater or to a solar hot water heater or going to high efficiency air conditioners. So it, it's this level of progression where we, we try and get the low cost things because they uh, are easy to stomach when you're slapping down a, a visa bill or whatever the case may be. Um, but then starting to progress to that better insulation and looking at better equipment. So uh, we can address specific things in one of the questions and I don't uh, mean to call anyone out, but we were talking about light bulbs and how important it was with this, this specific light bulb and how, how to fix this. And I said, well, you know, you're very, very focused on this, this lighting issue. Um, and the reality is if you put a timer on your hot water heater, you probably could save more power um, than in, in one day than you did all year on that one light bulb. So it's also attacking the things that are big bang for the buck and don't get so concerned or worried about any one little item. Look at that bigger picture and what is really using the most power in your home uh, and address those items. Michael? Right. Um, let me start with your folder. And let me see by raise of hands who has a folder. They got a folder. They all have a folder. Okay. <laughs> excellent, excellent, excellent. The reason why I wanted to point that out, because there is some information in there that talks about energy conservation. And, and when we think about three things, we think about no cost, low cost, and then some high investment or some investment. So, so let's start with the first one, that no cost one. By going to recommendations on this sheet, those are associated with behaviors. So thermostat settings, we like air conditioning. Our recommendation is 78 degrees on your thermostat setting. During the summertime, during the winter time, we recommend 68 to 70. So that's a behavior change. A lot of times, again, that behavior change is really about that no cost investment that doesn't cost you anything to do or any investment up front at all. Then we get into our low cost investment. And I think you heard Dr. Lingwell talk about you know, looking at insulation, looking at you know, uh, duct work. We talked about it earlier, sealing up duct works. When we look at doing an energy check, one thing we, we focus on when we come out to a customer's home is that we're going to send somebody to take a look into your attic. A lot of us don't spend a lot of time up there. I know me personally, I don't like being up there very long. It's pretty hot during the summertime. But we do spend time up there to help identify where some of those, I said, medium cost or low cost solutions could, could be uh, addressed. And also, we pay incentives to help you, re you know, let's say, seal up duct work or provide insulation. So those are opportunities there. And then when you get into some of the higher investments for those that have heat pump systems or straight, what we consider straight cool system with the, with the heat strip, 
we offer, offer incentives to help you go to a high efficiency air conditioning system or high efficiency heat pump. So, so make sure you take a look at this information. Visit our website, www.duke-energy.com. There's information on there that's going to tell you about all of our programs. But, but the first one I just want to make sure we, we talked about is that no cost solution. It really is it's up to each one of you in this room. And that's really to look at it from a behavior standpoint. Jeremiah? Yeah, I'd, I'd certainly like to, to echo that, that comment of, of, of your power usage. And actually, there's some really good uh, monitoring systems that are coming out on the market where you can actually hook it up to your, you know, every month you get an electric bill, but you may not know, what did I spend all that on? But there are real-time monitoring systems that you can put on your house, and you can actually see what kind of energy you're using. Um, I stuck one of these things. I have an entertainment center at my house. You know, it's got the TV and all that stuff. And I put a kilowatt meter on that, and I found out that my entertainment center uses more electricity for 20 hours that I'm not using that system than the four hours that I do use it per day. So I got one. I just put it on a power strip, and I turn that thing off when I'm done at night, and then I turn it on in the day. So those type of usages really, I mean, that kind of stuff really affects your power bill much more. Turning off lights when you leave the room, turning your AC up when you leave the house, those kind of things really do affect, uh, you know, how, how much energy you're cons going to consume. And uh, a statement that was made earlier, you know, the energy that you don't use is the most cost-effective energy that you're going to ever produce. So that's always number one. When we start getting into active systems, we do have to inject energy into our homes because of the lifestyles that we like. You know, the biggest sexy thing in, in the eco world is solar panel, you know, PV panels. I'm going to produce power that way. But in actuality, the most cost effective uh, of solar energy that you can use, especially in Florida, is solar hot water heating. I mean, this is free energy from the sun that you can just, and, and hot water heating, especially if you have electric hot water heating can be 20 percent 20 30 percent of of your energy bill so if you can displace that usage with a, a solar heater or some other type of heating element or or uh, on-demand uh, tankless hot water heaters you're really going to affect your energy consumption dramatically and then as you go up the scale i'm more than happy to sell you a great big pv system but the, the more you can reduce your energy consumption, the smaller the system you can buy, and then, you know, that's a smaller investment. So, you know, behavior and, and being able to monitor your energy usage, you'd be surprised where your energy is being consumed. And, you know, we, we all love our cell phones and our laptops and stuff like that, but those things consume a lot of energy in these phantom loads that we have all over. Anything that has a light on it, you know, your refrigerator has a little light telling you, that's just consuming energy all the time. So be very careful about your appliance purchases and, and things that you have plugged in. You may not know where your energy is going. We're talking and we're hinting around at this behavior thing. And as I mentioned earlier, it's like I can make an extremely efficient building if I took the people out of it. Um, <laughs> And so at the, the, we were at a conference in August in, called Green Trends. It was down in Sarasota. It's the Florida Green Building Coalition Conference. And Deirdre Irwin, who is with the Water Management District up in St. John's, uh, was talking about how she made her kids change the bathroom that they used because she had them start showering in the bathroom that was closer to the hot water tank so that they weren't turning the water on and waiting that three or four minutes. It seems like you're waiting for the hot water to get all the way over to that far bathroom. And she said that was a simple behavior change of, okay, kids, instead of showering at this end of the house, which is completely opposite from where the hot water heater is, go shower in this bathroom. And she said she was saving um, hundreds of gallons of water that were being wasted every day in every shower. And so that wasn't, they didn't have to, they weren't taking shorter showers. They weren't taking anything, you know, different. It was just shifting the bathroom that was being used. Um, and so we actually, as of the last two weeks, have started doing that at our house. Now, um, the 
six-year-old who decides he wants to sit down in the shower and just let the rain fall on his head, I haven't been able to solve that problem yet, but at least shifting what shower they're in. Um, so, so in a few months, we might have some interesting data on that, but that's a, a no-cost behavior change, and those are the types of things that I think you know, we're talking about, we just, we want technology and widgets, widgets to solve all our problems, and a lot of our problems are us. Here, here's a new question here uh, for Mike Gordon. Um, are there changes to the energy incentive program as a result of your recent merger with Progress? Okay. Right, good question. Um, again, we recently went through a merger, and, and going from Progress to, to Duke uh, did not change in terms of our, our programs. Uh, our programs still are in existence where we, we do offer incentives for residential as well as commercial uh, customers. Um, again, we talked about um, rebates for heat pumps, so if you're going to be putting in a high efficiency heat pump, there's incentives that still exist there. A duct test and repair program where we come in and do a performance test on the home and ultimately identify where duct leakage, where you're having some leakage at. And uh, again, you must have an all electric home to qualify for that. Um, we will, again, incentivize, uh, pay a part of the cost of first uh, $150 to, of the repair. And it's a very low cost uh, investment uh, to have that completed. We offer incentives for insulation, windows, window screen, window tent. So all of those programs still exist in terms of uh, incentives that we offer and help our customers to help improve the efficiency of their home. Okay. Thank you, Michael. Pavel, you're working with a local company that's doing some innovative uh, new housing development project. Can you tell us about that project and then tell us some of the energy and water features that are in there to promote conservation? Yeah, it's an uh, uh, eco-village Dunedin. Uh, it's a uh, Pinellas County Housing Finance Authority and uh, City of Dunedin joined uh, forces and, and we work with them in a public-private partnership project. It's pretty exciting. It's 25 uh, net zero energy townhomes, affordable housing, that uh, um, uh, if the stars are aligned, we should have the uh, site development permit in our hands next week and the shovels will hit the ground and we're going to start building something that's probably definitely the first of its kind in Florida, but might be even in the whole country. And, and uh, what makes it exciting for us is that uh, being able to uh, design an engineer and develop something to a kind of new market sector in the affordable housing area. Uh, uh, Many of these homes have to be sold to people with the 80% uh, um, uh, median income level in the county. And uh, really, the target market is, is to, to kind of change the trend as to you know, what the uh, typical perception is for uh, energy efficient housing and homes. In addition to that, we uh, um, were very fortunate to team up with General Electric and this is uh, uh, the very first affordable net zero energy uh, uh, GE Eco Imagination project in the world. And uh, they are quite excited about working with us in, in uh, uh, doing this type of uh, project. And uh, um, it's, uh, uh, in our mind, we are, our purpose is to create a blueprint that we can then use as a starting point in changing the trend in uh, uh, all of the uh, future projects in, you know, in, in our area, in the state, and then also uh, further across the nation. Uh, um, I was interesting, I was reading this, this packet when I came in here, and, and it has you know, concepts like the whole house systems approach and LED lighting and you know, the, the items that you were talking about, and that's exactly the approach we took, where we uh, 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 kind of looked at the whole scenario, not only from the perspective of energy efficiency, but also the value engineering aspect of it. Uh, uh, typically, items like solar are looked at that, um, you know, it's, it's an extremely uh, uh, questionable investment today as far as the paybacks and, and, and the affordability of it, but uh, as, as we are seeing almost now on a monthly basis, the cost of solar is coming down efficiency of the systems are going up and we have we are really able to to uh, uh, as we call it cash flow these systems day one which means that the cost of the system on monthly basis is less than 
you know, versus the electricity provides, especially here in, uh, uh, in our area. So that's kind of a nutshell what Eco Village Dunedin is all about, and you can learn more about that project at ecovillagedunedin.com if, if you're interested. Okay, thanks. I think we also have uh, some video uh, about the, the Eco Village project that's available on our PCC TV, the government uh, TV channel. It's also on YouTube. If people look for PCC TV One, is that it? YouTube channel or uh, go to the county uh, website to search for that, and we've got some uh, nice video coverage of that. The PinellasCounty.org homepage has a direct link to that as well. Thank you, Pavo. I'm going to ask Dan to tell us a little bit about clean energy, and we've heard some rumblings again this year about property assessed clean energy, and I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about that program and tell us uh, how a residential program, whatever framework, will be able to benefit Pinellas County homeowners and, and Tampa Bay homeowners overall. Well, uh, so there's there's kind of some good news and some bad news. Um, the property says clean energy is seems like a new concept, but it's really been around for about five years now. And what it allows um, you know residential and commercial property owners to do is effectively access um, you know available capital in their home to do these specific type of upgrades we've been talking about today. You know, very limited to energy efficiency, renewable energy water and wind hardening in the state of Florida. And what's unique about the program is that you um, effectively borrow this money, but it's not a personal loan. It's really loaned to your building, and then it's paid back with the property taxes. So it allows you to do this in a way that it costs you no money out of pocket, and it's not considered debt to you because it's associated with your building. So if you sell your building or your house, it stays with the building like all the other taxes. Uh, the bad news is the program is really not available here in Pinellas County, uh, but the good news is that Pinellas County, I believe we submitted about two weeks ago an RFP where they are going to select a vendor, and should we be chosen, then you'll see more of us. Should we not be chosen, you won't probably see that much of us, to implement a property says clean energy for the entire county, which is really uh, quite exciting. Um, I will say uh, hats off to the leadership of Pinellas County because um, uh, as, as much as it seems like every county in the country should be doing this, it's, it's a sporadic um, uh, adoption, if you would, and Pinellas County is the only county in the state of Florida that actually issued an RFP uh, in this calendar year. So, um, you know, hats off to the visionary folks that did that, and uh, should we be successful, this program would be available probably early next year and um, uh, we'll make uh, and whoever does it I'm sure will make it available and it's it's really a great way for folks to uh, to do this without any out-of-pocket cost okay thank you dr. Languel what do you see as the most common home construction flaw in regards to energy inefficiency in our area minus the people right <laughs> minus the people. we go back to that that human element um, I think there's a, for new construction, our biggest hurdle that we find is that um, we're still enamored by uh, sparkly things, granite countertops and uh, recycled glass tile and bamboo flooring or cork flooring. And, and we like the pretty stuff because that's the stuff we see. So it, it makes sense that we do. And I think a lot of individuals don't look at that long-term investment um, and when presented a would you like a high efficiency air conditioner which is a metal box or granite countertops and they're both five thousand dollars we tend to pick the granite countertops because we know what those are and they look pretty and there is also a perceived value associated and a real value associated with granite countertops um, whereas the value, so to speak, associated with high efficient air, conditioner, air conditioners isn't necessarily as commonly known. Um, and, and of course, we are lucky to have low energy rates and sometimes it is just less expensive in the long term to buy power. And, and we alluded to that with respect to analyzing you know, solar in some instances. It doesn't always, the numbers don't always work. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. But you really have to look at that as a long-term investment. People look at purchasing cars 
and cars, which um, we're looking at the safety rating, we're looking at the resale value, we're looking at the number of cup holders. You put more decision tools into a car purchase, which is a tenth of what you're going to spend or, or 10 or 20% of what you spend on a house. So we don't necessarily perceive or look at houses and go, oh, is this gonna maintain its value? Does this have good resale safety? Is this a healthy and efficient house? We don't look and perceive homes the same way. So I think a lot of it has to do with homeowner education and, and understanding how, again, informed decision-making so the flaw I see is we're not putting necessarily the right things in a house and the things that I see missing quite often are the easy things to make the house more efficient. And, and they could be sometimes just having light switches in appropriate places. So if the light switch for that light is on a path, I don't walk regularly. Um, when I'm leaving the house, I might not flip that light switch off. So a lot of it just has to do with convenience. You know, we like things to be convenient. So that's what I see missing. Just to add a little bit to that, and, and absolutely everything is correct. One of the things that we've been spending a lot of resources and, and research and design from a design perspective is to uh, uh, address exactly that kind of uh, uh, assessment where typically when the home is probably engineered and designed we can uh, 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 show the homeowner where the decision where you have to decide between the high efficiency, you know, 18 CR HVAC unit versus the marble, you know, countertop or whatever it might be, is actually where, for example, a home we built here in uh, Madeira Beach was a uh, 16 CR uh, uh, HVAC system, net zero energy home. Uh, 2,700 square feet, three-story, and only needed 2.2-ton HVAC system, which means that it wasn't now $7,000 for the HVAC system, it's only $3,000, and we still achieved exactly the same end result. So when the home is properly uh, engineered uh, in that regard, we are starting to see where those kind of decisions don't have to be made anymore. If you want to upgrade your countertops, you can, and you can still have the net zero energy home. A final note is that we look at it from a perspective that, uh, uh, you know, in our team, we have, you know, our guys have built hundreds of net zero energy homes, certified thousands of homes, and, and uh, uh, when we look at every one of our current home plans, uh, every one of them can be, you can go to local Lowe's and buy everything you need from that Lowe's to build a home. Uh, which means that there is no custom ordered or, or a custom designed mechanical or technological elements in those homes anymore. Everything is readily available uh, uh, for these types of uh, high performance homes. Go ahead, Michael. You know, consumers today are, are a lot more savvy versus back in, before 1979. I'm gonna go back a little bit. So, so a lot of the, I think it's more of a push and pull. So, so what we're seeing today, and I think builders understand um, that, you know, some of the things they offer are gonna be a part of that standard package. You know, so, so, so the countertop discussion, I think, does happen, but builders understand that a lot of times to, to basically be able to hit the right market, they're including some of those things in their standard package. What we do as a utility, uh, our goal is to, to help builders kind of put together whatever that package is so that we can help, again, incentivize them for, for building more efficient homes. And, and so, so we work closely with the builders through our Home Advantage program, which is about, again, target toward the builder to build that more efficient home. Not only does it apply to the residential single family home, but we also work with the multifamily market. So when the new condos are being built, we're also working with that specific market as well to help kind of, let's again, begin to raise the bar in terms of building more efficient homes in, in our communities. I tried to get in before when uh, Dan was speaking. Where can we write or call to help that program to be in this county? Well, um, uh, <laughs> there's this, uh, this wonderful uh, term called the cone of silence, and every time I hear that, I think about the Get Smart show with that, that <laughs> thing that comes down that never works. So I'm not exactly sure how much I can say, but I can say that uh, the county is definitely in the process of doing it, and um, probably if you check the county website, uh, it's public information when they will be reporting the results. 
as to their selection of a vendor, and then there are hearings. And so encouraging your county commissioners to move forward uh, with the program is the best thing you can really do. Um, but uh, at this point, I think it's probably a little, you know, early in the, in the process, but um, certainly I would say in the next 60 days, I think a lot will happen and, uh, and there'll be a, a posted hearing and you can go and encourage them to, to move forward with this type of program. But, but as I said, really Pinellas County is the, the, really the only county that's very active in, in bringing on a new program right now in the state. So they're already doing the right thing. I, I would like to, you know, he may not, he may have the cone of silence over his head, but I don't. So <laughs> I would definitely encourage you to talk to your public officials. Uh, energy, energy is all about, is a state level and a county level thing. Talk to your, your representatives, both the county commissioners, your state legislators, all those people. They do, elections do make a difference and your politicians do make a difference. The more they hear from you, the more they, I mean, these guys spend a lot of money influencing the, uh, the, the, their elected, our elected officials. So we have to counter that with, with uh, conversation with them that you care. Thank you, Jeremiah. My next question was for you, Jeremiah. You've been talking a lot, and we've heard from our audience about the tankless water heater, the storage water heater, the solar water heater. How does a homeowner or a Joe homeowner out there make that determination of which one of those options best fit if they're in need of replacing? Because we know there's a lot of emphasis on saving energy and saving water, and which one of those? If you can tell us three things maybe that a homeowner should probably consider as they're trying to upgrade. Um, when you're when you're thinking about uh, you know a hot water heater in sp particular, um, one of the things I would like to to mention is that if you see that your hot water is getting a little long in the tooth, start to investigate other systems that you may want to use, um, because when it breaks, you're going to want to get it fixed very quickly. And the quickest thing you do is you just run out to Home Depot and buy a new electric hot water heater and and stick it in just because. You want hot water tomorrow uh, or tonight. Um, I, I would certainly encourage you looking at, at, at solar hot water heating or the tankless hot water heaters, other alternatives. Um, hot water is a basic fundamental issue that we all need and want uh, for sanitation purposes. Um, the, uh, the different types of systems that are out there are, uh, are, are storage systems. Um, you're just going to need to be ready to do that uh, and, and, uh, and have, have that information available to you. Um, hot water systems are, work very well, especially in Florida. There's a number of different types of systems that you can do, and so your solar contractors certainly can get out there and take a look at it and, and make you aware of, of the different things that you want to do. Well, in sizing a system, it's all about consumption. So... If you have, if you're a family of five or something like that, uh, you know, a parents and a couple of kids, you're going to use a lot more hot water than if you're a single person living in a house by yourself. Um, so, how much hot water you use certainly depends on the type of system that you use, you want to install on your system or on your home. Um, so, consumption is always, you know, with any decision up here, consumption is always where you have to start, how much energy do I need? So we, can, we have a variety of systems out there to use and you can, uh, you can pick those depending on what kind of stuff you need. On that line of thought, um, years ago the, the solar heating system or the solar electrical systems for the house were way too expensive. They have come down dramatically but how long do you think before they really become affordable? One question. And the second question is, at this point, if I were to go and buy one for my house, how many years before it pays for itself? Okay, so this is, this is the question we always get on this. Um, and I, again, I'll divide this answer into two parts because we have the thermal side, which is your hot water, and your photovoltaic, which is electricity. Uh, a thermal system will pay you back depending on how much hot water you use and what kind of uh, energy you're using to make your hot water 
will pay itself back in probably four or five years. So a thermal system, it's very established technology. Uh, it's not real hard technology. And that, that the hot water systems are, are well established and, and very, very easy to use and, and very, uh, very uh, what's the word I'm looking for, um, reliable and that kind of stuff over the long term. So a thermal system will pay you back in three to four years. When we start getting into the photovoltaic side and the electric side, what the, the photovoltaic panels are basically a computer chip. And we all know what's happened to computer chips over the past 30 years. They get, they get more powerful and less expensive every year. So the, those cost factors are coming down dramatically. And we're looking at, you know, five years ago, we were selling at $10 a watt. And we had a $2 rebate from the state. Um, and we were selling a lot of systems at $8 a watt. Well, today, our systems are selling at $4 a watt. I mean, and that was only in, in four or five years. So those, uh, those incentives are not around, but a system today is cheaper than one that was available even five years ago with rebates. So that, one of the other things you have to consider about a, a photovoltaic system in particular is that it's a long-term investment. And a lot of times we worry about, well, it's gonna take me six years to pay that back, but that system's also gonna last you for 30 years. And so in 30 years, you're still gonna need electricity. I will guarantee that. And, and uh, so in 30 years, you will have bought that system three or four times. So pay me now, pay me later, or pay me now or pay him later <laughs> is basically how it works. And, and, and you have to look at those things as, as long-term investments rather than just short-term what is what's happening to me tomorrow and for some people that makes sense and for other people it doesn't make sense uh, you have to look through the financial models but I will say that it starts paying back immediately I mean as soon as you turn the system on your energy bill goes down <laughs> because you're now create you are your own power company now so you know a, a typical PV system on a home today is about a six-year payback depending on size and all that kind of stuff, but it kind of averages in that. And we, we do expect that to keep decreasing over time. Okay, thank you, Jeremiah. We have a question from the audience. I, I would just like to kind of ask, I think it might be you, Dr. Jennifer, about <clears throat> so many of the homes in our neighborhoods are concrete block built in the 70s. And it seems as though we can do a lot of things to uh, low hanging fruit, but the walls in the winter are cold inside, and it seems like that concrete block just makes the house cold. Is there anything kind of a, a fix for the exterior and insulation or inside, or is there any way to, to do anything with these concrete block homes, old concrete block homes? Thank well, you. My house was an old concrete block home, um, and I pulled those slides out, and I left them at the end of the, the presentation in case we needed them, but um, it was concrete block built in 1974, and when I did the remodel, I, I gutted the house because uh, there was a bit of mold on some of the, the drywall when I bought the house, and I said, okay, I'm gonna remove drywall until I find that there's no mold on the back of it, and guess what, the entire house was full. Um, so I ended up basically dropping all the drywall, and I was able to pressure inject foam into the cells of the concrete block, which uh, stop infiltration. So that's the, the, the leaks coming in through cracks and crevices. Um, but that doesn't give you a thermal break, so to speak. A thermal break I achieved by putting a rigid foam up against the wall. And then on top of that goes your furring strips and your drywall. So it's difficult to do unless you're not doing a very large rehab. Um, you can try to modify the colors of your home. They do have uh, different paint products out there. But the challenge is that we just don't have a lot of thermal transfer through the walls. 
in Florida. We don't have minus 20 degrees outside and we're trying to keep it 70 degrees inside. And so there are a few months out of the year that you're feeling uncomfortable, but the reality is the energy loss associated with that is minimal. So it's one of those diminishing return uh, items. You're going to get much more payback if you insulate your, your attic than you would from insulating your walls. So it's you know hitting the bigger bang items first. And the biggest bang item in Florida is not the walls. The thermal transfer that we lose through the walls is minimal. So it's going to be the leaks, it's gonna be the windows, it's gonna be the attic, it's gonna be inefficient equipment. But the R value of the wall, the, the insulating value of the wall is not a huge thing for us. So it, it's cheaper to go um, you know, and buy a sweater <laughs> than it is to try and, and address the issue of, of retrofitting a, a concrete block wall because it's just a very invasive process, a destructive process to do. Yeah. Can I just, just add a little bit to that as well? Um, the, the payback on that is, is going to be a little bit longer. Um, however, there is ways that you, you can have it done through wall injection insulation that you can have pumped into the walls. Now, we, we do offer a small incentive to do that, um, but you have to have an energy check first before we can offer that incentive and, and ultimately to see if you qualify. But, but to your point, there is a little longer payback. Insulation to attic, you'll probably get a lot quicker payback than you will definitely get it through your walls. Now, if you have stucco on the exterior, so, so where we've seen it work well is if you have a concrete block wall with a stucco exterior, they actually drill in from the outside and they can pressure inject foam into the walls you have to be very careful because if they get willy-nilly with the pressure, they'll blow the drywall off inside your house. <laughs> um, so because the, the concrete block is stacked together with mortar and there's holes and pockets in that mortar and if it's been there since the 70s, it's you know fatigued, uh, just like all of us are that have been around for, for that long. So just you have to have a good crew that knows what they're doing. But that's And then they come back and they patch the stucco on the outside and you have to repaint to finish it. But that's the only solution that we've seen retrofit for concrete block is the pressure injected foams. One last question from our audience for our panel. Mine's real simple. You, you, this is for Mike. You keep on off talking about rebates and so on. Are there any homeowner uh, fixes where Duke would provide a rebate on like for caulking and things of that sort because all the rebates that I've seen that you've offered in the past I've got to go hire somebody to do it and I do all my stuff I do all my own yeah. own and, work and, and that's a good point I'll, I'll tell you like I said mo in most cases um, if you can do it yourself and meet make sure it meets you know code um, and permitting you know you, you're gonna get a quicker payback anyway you know, and that's that's one point. But but the other part, we do have some do-it-yourself programs, and one of the do-it-yourself programs is a window tanning. I'm not the I'll be honest, I'm not the best window tanner. Okay. One of our tried, I had bubbles, and everything else, but but that's one of the programs that we do have, which is a window tanning program, which is a do-it-yourself program. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Let's thank our panelists today. Thanks again for coming today. Thanks to our panelists for doing such a great job in even yeah, distributing yeah, our door fine. prizes today. That's awesome. Thanks again for coming today.